Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 475 of the podcast and it is Friday 7th of February 2020 as I record this. So today I'm talking about writing non-fiction and repurposing your content with Amy Woods. Now this, this is such a great interview and I really enjoyed it because Amy is a great entrepreneur and a speaker and she knows exactly what she's doing with her business and with marketing and with clients. And yet this was her first book. Uh, so it was fascinating to hear about the challenges she went through in getting that first non-fiction book out in the world. Because I think, uh, especially with repurposing, because she, th- her initial thought was, oh, look, I have all this blog material. I'm just going to turn this blog into a book. And you can do that. <laughs> but as she describes, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into turning a blog into a book. And also, Uh, publishing a book, all the steps you have to go through when you first publish, even if you know what you're doing in other aspects of business, uh, there are challenges. So Amy had challenges around formatting and freelancers and even uh, the editing process, she talks about that. Plus, she gives some tips on marketing the book once it's available and repurposing content and why content marketing is still so important, which of course I definitely agree with. So that is coming up. In publishing news this week, uh, we heard a couple of weeks ago that the Audible Captions case had uh, finished, but now we've got some more information, publishing perspectives, reports that um, the Association of American Publishers has succeeded in stopping Audible from generating its caption feature on publishers' audiobooks without those publishers' express permission. So if you uh, don't remember this or or, um, are new to the show, basically Audible last middle of 2019 wanted to show captions which were generated by AI and their argument was that because the text is generated by AI and shown in very small snippets it was not a violation of the use of the text because they were generating it whereas the publishers have said no not happening and that is the ruling that has come down Um, what it basically has said that they can't generate those captions without the publisher's express permission. And this is great news, uh, very interesting. I Like, for example, I would be very happy to give my permission for this because as a listener to audiobooks, I very much see the need for this. Um, I definitely think there should be a permission aspect. It should be a separate right. But I don't think that should stop it happening. It'll be interesting to see what does happen with this because obviously Audible could certainly do this with the books that they have the rights to. And for example, they could include that in an in an independent contract if they wanted to. Um, but what they said is interesting. The advanced capabilities available to Amazon and its properties for example, artificial intelligence or AI cannot be applied to the intellectual property of the American book publishing industry without prior and transparent agreement of the copyright holders of that property. So, well, it was interesting that they used the term American. So I wonder if this case would will have to be also heard, for example, in the UK. <laughs> so we shall see. Uh, this was an um, association of American publishers. You'd expect it to be held up in other jurisdictions as such. But what I think this means is there's a broader part of the argument about the use of books with AI, because the article refers to the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, which is developing a a definitive list of issues related to the impact of AI on intellectual property. So... That's those submissions on that, which are separate to the patent office I talked about before. Uh, this closes 14th of February 2020. So I'm going to keep an eye on that because I, I've actually printed out their document, which I'll link to in the show notes. But it's very interesting what they are taking comments on. Many of the things I've talked about and a whole lot more. <laughs> so we're definitely at a point where this is being considered by the publishing industry. And what this means, I think, is that... Um, 
This is good because it means that companies like Amazon, Audible and anyone else, any other startup will have to get permissions in order to use things that may not have a right assigned at the moment. There is no, uh, you know, at the moment, I imagine they will put it into contracts, but at the moment you don't sign a contract that says I allow captions to be generated from the audio version of my book, but maybe that clause will start coming in. So we're definitely in this really interesting time when uh, things are changing and morphing. So yeah, and I find that personally exciting. <laughs> uh, talking of personal things, uh, I did, Orna Ross and I took a break from talking about technical stuff. And on the Ask Ally Advanced Salon podcast uh, this month, Orna and I talk about how to be creative for the long term and stop from burning out. And this was because uh, as part of my site audit, which I'm very pleased uh, has started to pay some fruit in terms of traffic, uh, cleaning up the old stuff on the website. Uh, basically, I've seen how many authors and sites and apps and podcasts have disappeared in the over the decade that I've been doing this. And so I wanted to really talk about what are the practices that help us sustain a creative life. And uh, you can find that on the Ask Ally podcast or just search Orna Ross. You can usually find things better. It's easier to spell. <laughs> O-R-R. N-A-R-O-S-S uh, on your podcast app and you'll find that discussion in uh, the first week of February 2020. So our discussion did include the idea of rest and the artist's date and that is what I've been doing this week. So I worked so hard in January to finish up uh, audio for authors and also narrate the audiobook. So that is done. That is in uh, the mastering phase. The audiobook's in the mastering phase. I've just got the print proofs back, so I'm going to go through those. It's such, it's quite an extensive book, so the print proofs will need more uh, attention than, than usual. <laughs> but that's what I'm about to do after I record this. But yes, I worked super hard and for the first time in ages, I actually finished all my work before going away because normally what happens is I you know we all have a holiday booked in advance and then you have to kind of stop everything and put it on hold and then come back to it but I had a really good finish I finished at sort of half past 10 on the Saturday and then we went away on the Sunday so we've been in Bilbao and San Sebastian in the north of Spain which is the Basque country they have a very different language um, so it's Basque language not Spanish although people do speak Spanish as well uh, we've been eating pinchos and drinking chacoli the local wine chacoli I keep, I keep trying to say chacoli but it's uh, the emphasis on the last syllable but um, I yeah, it was luck. We had amazing weather. I mean, this is, if you look on the map, the Bay of Biscay, Bilbao and San Sebastian are on, on this bay, a very exposed area of Spain. But uh, we had beautiful weather and a very uh, unusual for this time of year. We had walked around the beach, San Sebastian and the head there with the, the hill. And then in Bilbao, we visited the Guggenheim, which is stunning. Uh, you can see pictures of it, but really it's one of those it's essentially a sculpture. It is a building, but it's a sculpture. And I am such an architecture lover. I really am. I think in another life, I might have been an architect. <laughs> um, but there's also this uh, Louise Bourgeois sculpture, which I've seen before in the Tate Modern, probably 20 years ago. Uh, it's called Maman. It's a very large arachnid. And it has, I think it's it's super interesting anyway. I'm processing at the moment. I'm in artist date processing. But I did find a painting inside the Guggenheim, which is most likely going to go in my next arcane book. Because all my arcane books have different art and architecture in. And I usually find at least one painting that I use in the book for some kind of metaphorical reason. <laughs> in Valley of Dry Bones, uh, Morgan was in the Prado, uh, which also we visited and also in Spain. But I do I do find it so important to me to put the places and art that I found uh, touches me in some way or always gives me ideas. So it's part of my book research process is to go travel and uh, do things like that. So it was a good trip from relaxation. We certainly tried a lot of pinchos, <laughs> drank a lot of chacoli and uh, you can see my pictures. Now, I do have some on Instagram. 
at JF Penn author, but you can also find the pictures and thoughts and recommendations from the trip at booksandtravel.page forward slash Bilbao, spelt B-I-L-B-A-O. And uh, I'll put the links in the show notes as ever, but certainly that was a really good break between one book and the next book. So my plan is to start back with Map of the Impossible on Monday. So that's my February. The rest of February and March most likely will be uh, Map of the Impossible, which will complete my trilogy for the Map Walker dark fantasy books, which I'm very excited about. I'm totally ready to get back into fiction. I'm the, the creative cycle has turned. I have done all that finishing energy and now I'm ready to go with uh, Map of the Impossible. So yeah, I'm excited about that. I'll be up early on Monday morning, back to my writing cafe, back to first draft mode. And you know how that is. I mean, there's always these different stages. First draft mode is so different to what I'm doing today, for example, which is this very detailed checking of a print proof. (laughs) This is just part. I mean, you have to do that even if you're a traditionally published author. You will get PDF proofs to check uh, finally before they go uh, and actually publish them. But certainly it's the stage of, oh, I'm almost finished, almost finished. Uh, Yeah. Anyway, also on Books and Travel this week, uh, I interviewed Matt Buckman or the author M.L. Buckman. um, And Matt cycled around the world and I think it's it's taken him like two decades to get his memoir out (laughs) about cycling around the world because it's more a discussion on finding what really matters rather than you know, we talk less about places and more about the existential questions that you have to face on a journey like that. Now, Matt has been on this show before talking about estate planning. <laughs> and he's also a romance writer and he narrates his own audiobooks. And he's got a great new book about self narration of audio. But it's really good. It was so nice because I've known Matt for a number of years now and it was lovely to talk to him for books and travel because we do not talk about publishing. We don't talk about marketing. All we do is talk about places and emotional things. And so we have a really good chat. Matt really does share very openly, which is why I love that other podcast as well. This is useful. That one is more aspirational, I guess. So that's the books and travel podcast. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. A big thank you to everyone who completed my Creative Pen survey, uh, which was fantastic. I'm going to be going through all of those and coming up with new content plan for the blog and for the podcast and for my YouTube channel. So I will be having a think about that and uh, doing a lot more keyword research, trying to be much more strategic. And you will hear about that in the interview today with Amy, because we do talk about this and about how you have to be very intentional with content marketing in this um, new world because it's very busy out there, very noisy, as I'm sure you all know. So yes, thank you to the survey people. And I did send emails to the winner and runners up on Saturday. So if you didn't get an email, sorry, you you didn't... um, win. Congratulations to BB, Krista, Melissa and Brenda. Uh, I should say BB, Krista A, Melissa S and Brenda F, just in case there are other people listening with those names. But yes, you have already heard and you have responded to me. So thank you for that. Just wanted to say congratulations. A couple of comments from this week. Adam says on Twitter, I know you mention this on a regular basis, but I'm blown away by the fact that you sold books to 45 countries in a single month. And that's reference to me saying on the last show that that's what I did in January on Kobo, because Kobo has a lovely report that will show you the country. So yeah, it's very cool. Uh, SJ Pajona says, really enjoyed the podcast with Jerry. It was interesting to hear from a former FBI agent about the things books and TV often get wrong. I subscribed to her podcast right away. Yeah, it was good fun with uh, Jerry. And finally, on YouTube, Nicole says, really love this episode. Love how you always give away the farm in your videos, Joanna. <laughs> And that made me laugh because uh, that's also circling back to content marketing. This is the school I come from. This is the the school of the internet that I come from is give away everything and people will still want to support you by buying your books or whatever. So yeah, thank you, Nicole. And um, that was a comment from YouTube and I am 
planning more videos on YouTube. So if you are someone who does listen on YouTube, because at the moment it's audio only on YouTube and some of my backlist has videos. Um, but yeah, very. I'm looking forward to doing more with video at some point. Uh, it might be more live videos, um, you know, stuff like that. I'm thinking about it. Right, so today's show is sponsored by Draft to Digital, and I will play a word from the lovely Kevin Tumlinson in a minute. But did you know that Draft to Digital also do a live Q&A every month, which they put out on their blog? And there's also a transcript. And in January's episode, they talk about getting your book into libraries, print author copies, audiobook publishing, marketing for wide published books, and much more. Plus, if you need help with formatting, as you'll hear in the discussion with Amy, Draft to Digital do have free formatting options and they are listed along with other options at thecreativepen.com forward slash formatting. Draft to Digital have a free uh, ebook formatting option and uh, I think some print stuff too. Anyway. Fantastic. So that is coming up. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, including new patron this week, Lily Burkush. Thank you, Lily. And thank you to everyone who supports the show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. Like the tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. And you can support the show on Patreon with just a couple of dollars a month uh, at The Creative Pen. No, in fact, not at. (laughs) You'd think I'd know this by now. I mean, seriously. (laughs) Ah, You can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from Kevin from Draft to Digital, and then we'll get on with the interview. Hey, this is Kevin Thompson from Draft to Digital. So we love helping authors build and grow their author careers. That's why we started our monthly free webinar series, Draft to Digital, Ask Us Anything. Each month, three DDD experts answer your questions live and offer what we know about the indie author business. And don't worry if you can't make it at the time. We record each webinar and make it live via YouTube and Facebook, as well as on our blog. And as an added perk, each month we open up the lines for authors to schedule a free one-on-one author consultation with someone on our team. Slots are limited, so this is only open to the live attendees, but we'll do our best to chat with you and answer your burning questions, so tune in. RSVP for the next Ask Us Anything when you go to drafttodigital.com slash live. That's draft2digital.com slash live. Amy Woods is the CEO of Content 10X, which helps entrepreneurs repurpose their content for podcasting, blogging, and social media. She's also the author of Content 10X, more content, less time, maximum results. Welcome, Amy. Thank you for having me on. It's really great to be here. Oh, no, this is such an interesting conversation, I know, for everyone. But I want to start with a question that many, um, you know, business owners, people, you know, working in the sort of nonfiction space. So you already have a successful business. So what made you decide to write a book and why is it useful for entrepreneurs? Uh, So why did I decide to write a book? I guess there's a couple of reasons. So firstly, It was because I, with my business, we have a service that we provide to uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, but content creators, basically people who create video podcast content. And we teach them, well, through the service, we repurpose their content for them. But then I have a blog and a podcast where if we're not doing it for you, you know, I teach you how to do it. So I've grown an audience of people who like to learn through the podcast and through the blog. And I just felt like there was a gap in what I offered as a business because I went from completely free content, you know, and and just in lots of different blog posts, lots of different podcast episodes, not massively structured, but just free content um, to, you know, a, a service, which is, um, a fairly kind of a premium price service. And so there was there was the gap in the business where I wanted to be able to say to people, okay, well, maybe the service isn't quite right for you, but you want something 
easier to follow than, you know, trolling through blog posts and podcast episodes and things like that. So why don't you get a copy of my book? So I wanted to kind of have a product, um, have something that people could purchase in addition to the, you know, the service that wasn't quite high price, but would help people perhaps more so than the free content because it's, you know, well structured and goes into more detail. So that was reason number one, like a business gap. But then, you know, the other big thing was it's the whole thing about the authority, you know, just um, trying to make my stamp in the world as being a leading expert in content repurposing and knowing that, you know, one thing that people do when they have expertise is they, um, if, you know, if you have the time and the patience and everything, um, write a book, you know, so um, it, it just seemed like a, a great personal brand authoritative you know stamp to um to be an author of what I want to be known for basically Mm, fantastic Mm. and you and I met because we both spoke at the same event a couple of years ago um and do you do you think that the book um will help you with your speaking is it you know are you going to use it in that way yeah I, I think so I definitely think that it's just helped a lot with yeah, raising awareness of of who I am and what I'm about and what my, you know, my knowledge and expertise is. And I just noticed that people take, I, I, ever since, so it, the book published in, um, when did it, in mid-October, well, at the end of October, so it's not been out for an awful lot of time, but already I've had, yeah, people getting in touch with me, asking me to speak, and I had that already, but I find more so people are paying more attention now that I have a book. So um, more speaking and then uh, more people wanting to work with us, you know, like on, unusual and interesting inquiries like collaborations and things like that. And when I say, oh, you know, how did you find out about me, um, the book, you know, and some people really interestingly, I've noticed who have been maybe following me for a little bit and and interacting maybe on LinkedIn a little bit and things like that. But when the book came out, I've been all of a sudden, you know, really communicative and really, um, I don't know, just kind of have suddenly taken a bit more notice of, of what I'm doing and what I'm about. And I think I've noticed a shift of people thinking maybe that I'm more credible, you know, now that mm. I've done that. So I'm not necessarily after more speaking engagements like you know it's brilliant to speak and I love speaking on stages and it's just another great way of sharing your expertise and growing who I am and what we do as a business but um I didn't really do the book for that but I've definitely seen a correlation between the two Mm, that's fantastic Mm. so lead gen for the business and also for the speaking and Mm. yeah so that's really good so uh you obviously as you said you create content you repurpose content you know about content (laughs) but what was what were the challenges in writing a book specifically that might have surprised you um or also in the the publishing process I guess as well Oh my goodness. So (laughs) I can't even begin to tell you. So, um, it was really funny because I, so I had like kind of going back, I suppose I had the podcast and every week we were repurposing our podcast episode into a blog post. Okay. So it got to the point where I had over a year's worth of, of written content. So I thought, okay, there's lots of written content here. So in the whole spirit of repurposing, right, we, we can repurpose this year's worth of blog posts into a book, but then you know, it didn't quite go like that because, you know, there were loads of gaps. I want, I planned out what I wanted to go in the book, the outline, the chapters, what would go in each chapter, and then cross reference that against the content that already existed. And there were some places where I could, you know, um, take that content over and, you know, reword it and, and improve on it and add to it, but at least as a starting point. And then I identified loads of gaps as well. So then I could fill those gaps with podcast episodes and blog posts and bring that into the book. So the content creation, it took longer. There were, there were a lot more gaps and there's a lot more that I wanted to do, but I felt like when I got to the point where I had a final manuscript it was like right okay now you know let's just get this this out but then that was that was not that was just the beginning because um I had so many um so many challenges with the actual publishing side of it um the I get uh, the, the maddest thing that actually happened to me was I was getting it into the required format for paperback. So I'd been working with somebody who had been great at letting, you know, helping me get it into e-format, Kindle format for, for those platforms. But then for the paperback, 
I wasn't really happy with just the like, you know, a PDF from Word. I wanted it to be better designed. So I had hired somebody, a freelancer, to help me with getting it into, they used like Adobe InDesign to make it look, you know, better designed. But what was a massive problem there was firstly, they'd said that they had all these skills, but then when I started working with them, they really didn't. So it was mm-hmm. really, really painful um, trying to get it into the, re- they had no attention to detail. So, you know, it was just really painful. But what he did, um, he he put into my book swear words, right? Well, our swear word, he just weaved in, he changed an entire sentence and um put like i'm not uh, you probably don't want me to swear on the show no. do you? so i'm not <laughs> going to show. Swear. yeah it, let's not get that e sign next to it on apple love it with him and everything <laughs> anyway he changed a sentence and i don't even know why because like you know it's just so weird and he um and he and it, it wasn't the slip of a hand he wasn't changing words anyway he was only changing it from one format to another and and made it um really rude and offensive and I didn't even know. So I had my books, um, uh, 10 copies of the book printed that I took with me to podcast movement event. And it was just to showcase them. The book wasn't released. It was going to be released another month later, but it was on a um, early stage like release, like a soft release. And I was only just flicking through the book and just spotting it. it was like, wow, like this is crazy. <laughs> um, went back and looked at what I'd sent him you know what what mm. what he'd received to see if it was any mistake at Aaron and knew it wasn't I can't tell you how many eyes had gone through it before you know we were um getting to that stage and you know he had just you know sabotaged it chosen to weave this in and I suppose see if it ever got noticed I don't know who or why anyone would do that um but that was that the, I was so thankful that I'd only printed off a small amount and I hadn't actually been I'd just given it to a few people so really controlled small amount and thankfully like I hadn't that hadn't been like the final version that went on and got got sold on all the different places but um I had that was the weirdest thing that happened to me mm. but then I just think um that it was that those aspects were quite tricky tricky you know going from whatever you've typed your book into whether it's word or whatever um whatever word processing software you use through to the different formats for you know for kindle and for um paperback and i did an audio book as well and i had a, a funny issue there as well with my audio book um whereby i spent I turned up at the studio i had a, she was working in a studio and i thought it'd probably take three goes um like three days maybe to to get it done so i booked it one day a week for three weeks and as did the first day I, you know, it was really intense. I, I, as a podcast, I didn't, because I'm used to speaking into a mic and, and all of that, I thought I'd probably find it maybe easier than if I'd never done anything like that before. But, you know, I found it really, really draining um, to keep the energy levels up and to keep interested and to even be paying attention to, you know, what I was talking about. <laughs> um, because, it, you know, it's a, like a long, a, a long session. And then at the very end, you know, I felt so accomplished that I'd got I like, you know, maybe about a quarter into the book it's a really long book and then um in nothing recorded from the entire day <laughs> I said to them you know can you download um it onto my computer and then get it over to my my editor to do the edits and stuff and they there was just they came over and there was just you know just this this really blank look and they were like are you you know are you sure you hit record I was like yeah you know I've been doing exactly what you told me all day like t- to the letter and then they, they just yeah they said we'll go home we'll probably find it and I knew they were not going to find it because the looks on the faces they were mortified um but their their software you know their recording software failed on that day um so so I had that as well, which was like just crazy. Oh um, my goodness. I know. But I think it's all the things that you don't really know are gonna come up, isn't it? So things like formats, formats of each type of of how the book's gonna come out, and then understanding this entire world of Amazon. So although I found the process of getting the book onto Amazon fairly straightforward. I think it's all the things that, you know, are so grateful when when you really helped me, but things that you don't know about keywords and about um categories and and how you need to do your research on that and then different platforms that you can sell your book on, especially if you want to go for 
you know, more than, you know, broader countries for all the formats, so different platforms for um, your audio, for your ebook, for your paperback. Um, and so it was all of that afterwards, privileged to have, you know, a graphic design team that could do things like the front and back cover and things like that. And, you know, helped work with people to help me a bit with the manuscript and the getting it into the Kindle format. But there's so much after that, isn't there, that you just don't know what, I didn't know what was going to hit me, I guess, with all of the other bits yeah. that came well, up. I, well, first of all, thank you for your honesty, because I think so many people, because I've been doing this for like 32 books or whatever, um, <laughs> with the first book, and this was your first book, right? I mean, yeah, you, exactly. you basically hit everything and you did have a timeline. And I remember when we spoke last year and you, you were like, well, I wanted to get it out by then or whatever. Yeah. And that, that's the issue. It, there's a lot involved in publishing especially when you want all all the formats and um yeah audio is really tiring and there's lots of things you you just don't expect so thank you for sharing that that's really good and also to kind of point out that if you do feel that you ever want to write another book you will know oh, yeah. <laughs> and it will be easier <laughs> next time <laughs> yeah it's a massive learning experience and and, and it's worth it but yeah it's, it's a huge learning experience it doesn't end when you write the last word does it <laughs> Not I, I at remember all. <laughs> um, our mutual friend Chris Ducker and I was in his like he was mentoring me and I remember when I felt like I'd written the last word and um I said you know some kind of congratulatory you know I said something I maybe I shared like a, a glass of champagne on social media and I said you know finish my book and I remember him so jokingly saying oh you think so do you you know just because you finished the last <laughs> word on the manuscript you've not finished your book um and, and he was right you know but but also I think um I fell into the trap a little bit but I don't regret it for one second where um I when I thought I'd finished it and I decided to do you know one a run through you know a, another read through of course you know like now I'm going to read the whole thing and um I I just started to almost completely rewrite so much of it because I'd started writing it so much early you know like it took me a long time to write it so when I was revisiting things from the earlier um, times of writing you know I really wanted to change a lot of it and I realized some of it wasn't as evergreen in it because it's about content marketing and things like that there were some things I wrote that I had to adjust how I'd written it because I realized that that's not going to stand the test of time for very long at all because this world of social media and content it moves so fast you know really should change how I phrase this and phrase that so when I did the second run through again, I thought oh, it won't take me long, you know, a week here and there and I'll get the whole book read and and rewritten. But even that probably took like six weeks or something in the end, because it is long book, about 100,000 words, maybe a bit longer. Um, and the read through again and the rewrite, but I don't regret it because every bit of everything I rewrote was worth the rewrite. But I didn't factor things like that into, you know, the next review and the next review and, <laughs> and all of that. <laughs> Well, I think you, you know, you did a great job. Um, oh, and I just wanted to circle yeah. back to the tip on the paperback, which is mm -hmm. there's a reason that we proofread the actual physical product. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we can order author copies before they go live. And um, again, it's like once your team is in place and you trust your team, like I don't check my paperbacks anymore because I, my designer and I have worked together for like five, six years now, probably more. <laughs> So, but it's like the first time you do it, these things happen um, and you kind of, then you learn to sort them out for next time. But that is it, really great lessons learned there. So I want to get into the book itself because yeah. I know people listening um, really interested in content. So I want to start with, you know, the overwhelming amount of content there is in the world. Uh, and the fact that you and I both started a good number of years ago now with content marketing. So is content marketing still a valid strategy in 2020 for, for marketing, a business or a book, for example? I really do think that it is. I think it's, it's almost the strategy because if you think about it, the moment you know we can google anything so whenever we want to find anything these days the answer to anything or anything like that we tend to google and we tend to go down rabbit holes and we work out you know the answer to questions but also you know who we want to work with who we want to hire for things and things like that and i think that it depends completely on what your business is and i'd never ever think that there's a one-size-fits-all answer to you know what kind of marketing works for 
what business it really does depend but i especially think that if you are um selling something a product or service where you know it's very high competition and if you're smaller and you're up against bigger brands and and giants and things like that it's your content marketing that will often really help you stand out because that's where you know you're putting the time and effort into to help people to offer up free content to answer people's questions in advance before you've even met them Um, and people will go down that rabbit hole and start to know like and trust you through your content and you just can't get that through a Facebook ad or through a Google paid you know AdWords appear at the top page of Google um, or all those kinds of more uh, you know the, the kind of marketing that is just not content driven as such but just trying to get people to to sign up for something or to um, book a discovery call or so anything like that and I, I always think that I don't know like if you compare if you were let's say looking to have a extension built on your house and you were looking at local architects and one website had just you know it was a bit like a, a leaflet really not any content on it such but just some phone numbers and an address and some photographs and another had uh, help and advice like tips on how to get you you know how to choose an architect what planning processes are all that kind of stuff offering that help and then you went on the social and you saw faces and humans and people and more tips and more advice it's a no-brainer who you would pick up the phone and call the, the, the you know the, the one that's already offering their knowledge their expertise they seem human there's people or like you know just a website with a, an email address a phone number and not much else so I think content is so so important but like I said I really do think it does depend whether it's product-based service-based you know what you're selling price points and things like that but it's a slower game but in the longer run I think that it it pays more than any other form of marketing that anybody could do Mm, and and it sort of builds over time whereas I always yeah. say you know pay-per-click ads whether they're Amazon ads or Google or whatever you know they they might get you one sale right now but then that's it you've paid for it it's done and yeah. the longer term stuff like the more content you build the more likely you'll get discovered you know it's, it, it really is that long uh long tail long term <laughs> It is really, isn't it? And you have to have faith in it. And and I guess you have to, um, you have to have a plan and a strategy and not just create content for content's sake. But, you know, you do really need to be thinking about it's the, you know, who is your audience and, and what kind of questions would they be asking and how can you be answering those questions? And I think it's, it's if you have a scattergun approach to creating content and you just create lots of different content about maybe a few too many different things and you don't stay in the lane of what you want to become known for then then I think you can waste time and money on content marketing I think it needs to be really backed up with a strategy and knowing where you want you know what you want people to do but more so if you have a business and you solve a problem for people then through your content they should very quickly be able to answer the question, what problem does does that person solve? What problem does that business solve? And if you're got, you know, if you're not clear with that and you you're creating content all over the place about different things, and people even like you and follow you, but then if somebody said, Well, you know, but what what's their business? And they said, I don't know. Like I'm not really sure what problem they solve. I just really like the blog post, or I don't really know. Then someone who loves you and follows you might have a problem that you can solve and not go to you because they actually didn't realize oh is that what you do like I didn't even realize that I love your <laughs> blog and I love your podcast but I didn't realize you did that so I think um I think you do you can waste time and money if you don't have a strategy you need to make sure it's really clear and really aligned and we can talk about all sorts of things but if one minute you're talking about I don't know, like Facebook ads. And then the next minute you're talking about getting up at 5 a.m. every morning. And then the next minute you're talking about, you know, I don't know, like um, things that annoy you on the school run or something like that. Um, And it's all scattergunny. Then who, how is anyone going to kind of know what to get in touch with you about? But if you're really focused, you're building your personal brand, you're building awareness, you 
you're getting there's more chances people are going to find you through google search people are going to understand more about who you are and what you're about on social and it will work in the longer term but you just need to be intentional i think that may be a mistake when people sometimes say it didn't work maybe they weren't as intentional and didn't have as much of a strategy behind it as, as they could have done or they're confusing failure and boredom and actually they got bored and stopped and, and it didn't we didn't give it enough chance as well so yeah you know yeah I think that yeah. Can, sometimes that happens I also think that writers I mean my audience obviously writers first um writers are used to being in their own heads and we write our mm-hmm. books mostly for us first we don't necessarily and then we think about marketing them and I feel like I definitely over you know over a decade on the creative pen I didn't set out with a clear strategy of who I wanted to reach I mean you know I, I grew into that over time but I wonder you know there are some things that um, you know could potentially sell books more than others so what are some content marketing ideas for authors in particular or that things you found around the book have made a difference well um things that I found that have helped so firstly sharing excerpts of the book so and I, I guess it really does make a difference doesn't it whether we're talking about fact uh, you know fiction or in my case because the book's a bit more almost yeah, like stick, a, a stick with non-fiction yeah, cause yeah, cause it wouldn't, yeah yeah that wouldn't really work but for my from what I know so for my my business book um so sharing excerpts so we were you know breaking down so it's, it's great because it, I guess it's repurposing but We have, you know, loads of different chapters on different things like chapters for bloggers, chapters for video creators, people who do live stream, people who are speakers and things like that. So we've done lots of sharing on social media of um, taking anything like being visual, like so taking photographs of just like the chapter header and things like that. So the chapter header on live events and then um, a photograph of that with then text saying, did you know that in the book, if you attend live events, we you know, have a whole chapter that teaches you, you know, X, Y, and Z, or more so, you know, do you want to find out about this? Then you can love chapter 10 in the book that's all about about that. So like breaking the book down into the different, you know, problems that we help people with in the different chapters and not just sharing it in written format, but um, photographs and images and things like that as well. So lots of sharing of the content in bite-sized format for different social media platforms has been super useful. And then I guess because, um, and this would still, I guess, stand forever, but certainly in the early stages, we've been doing quite a lot of sharing of the book reviews as well. So that's all of the social proof has been great. And I think we've done it from a couple of different angles. We have shared more formal uh, book reviews in terms of we've gone on to Amazon and we've taken uh, the great reviews that we've had and we've turned them into graphic designed um, images for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and, you know, whichever platform you're on. Um, And then we've shared them. So people will see those coming up in the feed, like a great review. But then we've done more you know, kind of raw, like rough and ready type versions of that, even down to just taking a photograph of the of it on the Amazon page, um, various kind of screenshots and things like that. So a real mixture of bringing them to life visually um, and then also getting that those reviews and updating those reviews and putting them onto our website as they've been coming in as well. So the social proof has made a massive difference. And then also we have um, taken photographs of people with the book and, um, either, you know, me with someone with the book or getting people to um, take a photograph of themselves and, and share those out on social as well, which has been great, you know, just sharing that it's all around the world and people are reading it and things like that. So lots of that kind of content. Mm. And then I think, so something um, that was quite cool that I did last week actually was I shared the foreword of the book on the book page of our website. So um, in, where it says like forward by Chris Ducker and we took a sentence and just put that on the website. Now we just say hit play 
play and listen to the forward by Chris Ducker. So, um, like you know, and I, I did double check we were allowed to do that on the on the audible terms because you can only you, you go allowed to share up to ten percent of the bucket. You can have an excerpt, yeah, yeah, and so it was only excerpt. three minutes, yeah. So we're like, I think we can get away with that. Um, mm. As a podcaster, I shared chapter one of the book as a podcast episode as well. Um, so again, that was kind of repurposing. So when the book launched, you know, I, I said, you know, this week's podcast episode, I'm actually sharing the whole chapter one of my podcast this week's podcast episode. Mm. So we've managed to make use of audio in ways that um, as an audio uh, producer with a podcast, I guess I had that outlet already to do that. But then it was pretty nifty sharing the forward, which anybody, you know, could do. So that was cool. Mm. Um, What about podcast interviews? Obviously, we're doing one now about, you know, and I said, once you have a book, then I'd love to have you on the show. Um, Have you found, you know, more podcast interviews and now you have have the book? Yeah, so that's a a brilliant avenue. So I... um, I, you know, in taking your advice for sure, you know, really appreciated your advice on this because I got in touch with people that I already knew and asked them if there was, um, you know, any opening to come on the podcast anytime soon to talk about the book, if I knew that they had a really relevant audience. And then people have been in touch with me too, people I've never met before who got, you know, heard of the book, got hold of the book and invited me onto the show to talk about the book, which has been brilliant. And I actually think that that is, that is probably one of the most effective um, marketing strategies actually, because I feel like if people have if you're a podcaster and you have an audience that listens to your podcast, then they're, you know, people who are turning up every week or every couple of weeks or day or whatever it may be um, to listen to to you. It's, it's, it's intimate and they obviously like the podcast, like the host and trust you. And so when you're interviewing somebody and you're talking all about, you know, a book, you already have a really more captive audience than I find any other form of content out there because it, I just find podcasting is another level of content experience that people share with with you know, with their followers, with people who tune in. So I find that they make such a difference because it's more expressive. And although you could say the same for video content, I just feel that you get so much out of podcast interviews, of talking to people. People like the host and trust the host. So they trust who you bring onto the show. And as long as you make sure it's targeted. So advice that you gave me, which I loved, was to not just focus on like a niche that you're familiar with as well so for me I'm quite familiar with with you know the content marketing digital marketing world and I guess a bit like the online business so it's really natural for me to reach out to my buddies in that space and say oh you know hi you know Janet Murray can I come on your show or Andrew and Pete or whatever but actually you know your tip on well what about other niches like like mumpreneurs let's say because I'm a mum and like and, and I've written a book and I could definitely relate you know to that side of things or um I know like I had a tough time with my health and you said even like people maybe this podcast of people talking about struggling you know going through adversity and and coming out the other end and things like that so different angles as well not just the industry that you know but as long as you think there's an audience there so that's more on my agenda for this year Mm. but I think that makes you know we've talked about user generated content and sharing that we've talked about reviews talked about like repurposing like extracts of audio and and written and things like that but yeah podcast guesting and I think also and another thing that I've done which is very similar to podcast guesting but being invited onto people's live shows as well so I'm finding increasingly Uh, there's people who have you know maybe a weekly Facebook live or um, some kind of show you know like a video show Mm. and I've been invited on to to a fair few of those what I really love about going on to somebody's live stream is the interaction because they can say to people who are watching if you have a question you know type them in the comments below and then you, you can actually you know interact with the people which it, it you know then takes it to another level of really tapping into a community and the interactive nature too so 
um, I think they they're wonderful being involved in live shows as well. Mm. Wow! And so you've mentioned video there, and I know, I know a lot of my audience are like, "Oh, I just I don't want to do video." But in your content marketing predictions for 2020, you mentioned more video, and you said Instagram and LinkedIn, which was a surprise to me. Um, so, um, and we're almost out of time. But on mm. on video, um, what would be some good ideas for video? You mentioned a live stream there, but any other ideas around video? For for uh, authors in particular? Yeah, well, I would say, I guess, um, that I only think that you should create video content if you do feel comfortable with it. And I totally, completely get it that it's not something that everybody feels comfortable with. And I don't think that you should create any, you know, especially commit to any kind of content medium that actually you're really uncomfortable with and you find it a chore and you, and you, and you, and you dread doing it. You know, if you, you know, I'm going to do a video every week this year and then you dread it. Like that's just not going to be great because the most important thing is consistency. And if you can be consistent with your blog or with a podcast, then, you know, do what is consistent. But I think, um, you know, to get comfortable, if if you're wanting to get started with doing more video content, and it is huge, like, you know, the, they've been saying for so long in various statistics and and, and um, research studies that as we get now into, you know, scarily 2020, um, that more than 80% of content consumed online is video content. So, you know, everything there kind of says, well, if that's what people are consuming, then it's worth considering, should I be doing video content? But there's loads of different ways from, we said live stream and, you know, pre-recorded and all the different platforms. I think, to get started, it, probably a good idea to just dip your toe into the more micro, um, like bite-sized videos. So if you are on Instagram or on Facebook, then I'm even talking about stories. So getting used to just doing less, you know, just 15 second um, video clips, like, you know, sharing aspects of, you know if you're taking people on the journey as an author of what what life is like as an author and what you're currently working on things like that then um sharing bite-sized video snippets of you talking to camera more about that or about your recent book and that kind of thing or sharing testimonial social proof but I think uh, for me I got more comfortable on camera when I first started out doing you know little short snippets I also think that you could then step that up to maybe just doing, you know, less than one minute or around one minute videos and sharing those on platforms, on social media like LinkedIn, et cetera. And then if you feel comfortable, maybe stepping up to something bigger, like, you know, live streaming is the, like, you know, it, you do have to be quite. <laughs> yes, you have to like, be ready. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, it's quite scary, isn't it? Like I don't um, really do it. Yeah. No. I mean, you and I this is recorded in advance. There's no one yeah. here. We can get it wrong. <laughs> yeah. But live streaming, that's kind oh. of a bit more like speaking, I guess, in, in public. You know, you have I, to keep going. <laughs> I know. And I think there's loads of people people have fear of, of the gear and the setup and stuff. And people have fear of, you know, what could go wrong and that kind of thing. And then I think there's also if it because it's very public, uh, the fear of nobody turning up as well. So you do a live oh, yeah. stream, you know, in a big live stream, everyone's joining me at 10 a.m. Uh, on Friday, and then people can see, oh yeah, you've got no one watching this at the moment. And, stuff. and I know, that, you know, I have a friend who does a weekly Facebook live, but to be fair, he doesn't get that many people that watch it, but he gets loads of people watch the replay and stuff. Mm, so to be exactly. fair, people do watch that, but. Um, that's the scariest, I think, isn't it? I, I don't know whether if you're not that comfortable on video to go straight to live would, um, you know, you know, it's not saying you shouldn't do that. But I think that's quite a big leap, whereas I think it's good to start micro, bite size, maybe build up to a little bit longer um, and then look at maybe more longer form. But I think maybe the most important thing and I know we, we sh we're going to wrap up soon, but one of the most important things is that you don't have to feel like it has to be really overly polished and um, it, it can be a bit more, you know, raw and, and not, you know, not everyone's got like a production team doing fancy editing and things like that as well. So you don't have to get hung up on that. Mm. What's the message and what are you trying to become known for? Um, and really just focusing on those aspects and not being scattergun in your messaging and then try different mediums and, and see what works. 
Um, and yeah, LinkedIn have brought out live streaming, which was one of the reasons I shout did a shout out to LinkedIn because um, it's not just brought out like it, but it's invitation only and still is. It's been a year of invitation only and it still is. Mm-hmm. And I mean, don't it's like a not exclusive club. It's just that you have to apply to to have it. And then when you do have it, it's not native. You have to use a third party software to actually use it. So it's no, it's not simple. Um, but I just think that because we don't see as much video and live video in particular on the platform, when people do go on there and do that kind of content they get a lot more love from the platform in terms of being put in front of more people and you get to stand out more so I think if you're you know really trying to stand out and you want to kind of be brave and be a bit of a pioneer in doing that kind of content you will that you'll have a massive like um step up from the platform itself because um it's all very new and they're trying to push it Mm, no, that's a good tip. And I think for nonfiction authors in particular, LinkedIn is a good platform, um, particularly if they're trying to get business. Talking of business, uh, <laughs> you obviously have the wonderful Content 10X book if people want to check that out. But um, also some people do find content creation and repurposing difficult and hard to manage. So tell us what Content 10X does, the company, and also where we can find you and the book online. Yeah, of course. So we um we basically repurpose content for uh businesses or individuals who just want to reach more people so we work with mainly podcasters video creators and and bloggers and essentially it's a service that we offer so we, my team consists of copywriters, um, video editor, audio editors, graphic designers, publishers, etc. The whole kind of content marketing team, I guess. And what you do is you you outsource to us that step. So our clients commit to creating their original content, their original video or a podcast or blog post. And then we take care of the rest. So then we turn that into, let's say it's a video, we turn it into a blog post, maybe a podcast episode, um, short videos for different platforms, graphics, infographics. So, you know, we, we, we turn it into more content. So the 10 X is not necessarily you know everyone's content gets turned into 10 different things it might be 20 50 whatever but um that's what we do so it's an outsourced content service and yeah if you know if anybody wants it done for them then do get in touch and if you want to learn how to do it then there's the book but to get in touch um it just content10x.com everything from social platforms to all information about what we do it's just all out content10x.com Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Amy. That was great. Oh, thank you for having me on. It's been fantastic. So I hope you found the discussion with Amy interesting today, both for the challenges of creating a nonfiction book and also for the potential and those marketing tips of repurposing content uh, for marketing and for other streams of income. And if you were horrified at her issues with formatting, <laughs> you can find my suggestions at thecreativepen.com forward slash formatting. There's some free options. There's some premium options there. And also in my free ebook, Successful Self-Publishing, available on all the usual ebook stores or on my site under the books pages, you can get it there as well. So next week, I'll be talking about writing fight scenes with female characters with author and martial artist Ike Flintheart. Happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.